on, on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki. They actually had to have, under this agreement, the signature of the British government representatives. And it was readily granted. The representatives on the Tube Alloy Combined Policy Committee on July the 4th, 1945, uh, signed uh, the OK for the dropping of those bombs. Appropriately enough, of course, that was American Independence Day. Point three, only telling others by agreement. That meant, of course, it was agreed not to tell Stalin. But it didn't matter because he knew anyway because of the 20 spies that were over there. What really troubled him, however, really troubled him when he discovered this on coming to office, and you'll like this, was Clause 4. <laughs> and Clause 4 was the only one that really mattered to the United States, this other rubbish. Clause 4 said that the commercial and industrial uses of the nuclear program should be limited in such a manner as the president, the president, might consider fair and equitable in view of the large additional expense incurred by the United States. That was the clause really mattered. So there we have it. For shared knowledge and joint development, joint development, two alloys, read controlled by the United States. <clears throat> Any future commercial benefits shall be controlled by the United States government. That's what he said, and that's what happened. That was not regarded as a wartime convention, which incidentally, the signature on the one about needing consent to drop bombs was regarded as a wartime convention. And they soon got rid of that in Congress. This was, of course, not regarded as a wartime convention. <clears throat> so there we are. We're now back after that little bit of history, which I hope not all of you knew. We're back in 1945. The war is over, and the People's Party is now in power. But Lend Lease is ended. Desperate economic problems exist throughout Europe. Cities are in ruins. Tens of millions are dead. And who dominates the world stage? Who holds the winning hand? Hugh Dalton, the Labour Chancellor, put it very well. The Americans have half the total income of the world. Half the total income of the world. But won't either spend it in buying other people's goods, or lending it, or giving it away. Very nice position to be in. Then, on top of all that, the good old shared knowledge, true alloys, joint development agreement took another blow. In 1946, legislation was introduced entitled the Atomic Energy Act in the United States, commonly called the McMahon Act, after its instigator, Brian McMahon. Senator Brian Mahon, a man worthy of a talk, all on his own. Actually, I only need to tell you one thing about him to make you understand what I mean. He said in the Senate in January 1946, the atomic bomb is the greatest, greatest event since the birth of Christ. And he went on to help tell her and all the others develop the United States monopoly of that bomb by supporting and passing and bludgeoning act after act. He died in 1951 from cancer, but he'd already achieved a lot. So, the McMahon Act stipulated that atomic information should no longer be shared with the United Kingdom. All that cooperation, down appropriately enough, the tubes. In withdrawing cooperation and exchange in complete contradiction of that second Quebec Agreement, this one, uh, we don't know about this yet, you'll soon hear about it, this one was written 
uh, on a naive memoir, or resulted in a naive memoir, composed by Churchill, but accepted by Roosevelt, that stated in paragraph two, full collaboration between the United States and the British government in developing the tube alloys for military and commercial purposes should continue after the defeat of Japan and less than until <coughs> terminated by joint agreement. But of course, as we know, the United States don't like anything as they're now doing with the Missile Defence Act, the um, Strategic um, and Missile Defence Act um, agreement, a rough, rough shot over anything they don't want to do. The reason for this act, the reason given for it, was that there were too many British spies in, in, in the projects and they were likely uh, to leak the information to the Russians. Well, of course, that was true, but of course, that wasn't the real reason. Anyway, the act demonstrated the extent of the dominance of the United States over the British government in nuclear matters from that moment, and it was a pattern that has never been broken. It was not until 1954 that any amendment was made to the McMahon Act and a new agreement for cooperation, ha ha, was established on the 15th of June 1955. I'm not going to go into that murky agreement, sufficient to say it involved the rather dubious exchange and unfair exchange of uranium and, uranium and plutonium. A further agreement was signed in three years later, but it's all meaningless. As for the leaking of secrets by the 20 uh, or so spies, the most insightful comment ever made about this matter was by the American satirist Walt Saul, uh, when the Pentagon during the 60s was claiming that Russian technology was miles ahead, miles in advance. There was a missile gap, we'll never catch up. And Walsall acidly observed, if they are so far ahead, why don't we just give them all our goddamn secrets and put them ten years behind? <laughs> <laughs> the jingoistic remarks by Ernest Bevin that I mentioned earlier about the Union Jack were clearly reflecting the anger that the Labour Party felt over what they saw as a betrayal in the enacting of the McMahon Act. Well shown the buggers, if they don't want to help us, we'll make it by ourselves. Mm. Well now, what do you think? Was it a splendid triumph of British bulldog defiance and ingenuity? Or was it what the American government wanted all along? A European nuclear power under United States control, but with the British government, shouldering the expense, whilst becoming a loyal customer, purchasing highly costly and largely useless nuclear weapons for the foreseeable future. Did you know, for instance, and this is just one of hundreds of examples I could give, that the concession granted allowing Polaris submarines to be based in Holy Lock was part of a deal entitling the Tory government to purchase, at considerable expense, a missile that was never made. Yes, the Skyball. Here it is in here, don't believe me. Defence white paper, in which it says, in their own special language, Skybolt is coming, subject to successful completion of the project. That way of saying it's never coming. Worse still, it was necessary to make another useless deal in order to get a little bit of that money we'd already paid for the weapon that didn't arrive back. And rights granted in return for something mentioned earlier, martial aid, and for having Polaris under Atley, Wilson and Callaghan afforded the US military tenancy of parts of the UK virtually in perpetuity, made us the unsinkable aircraft carrier. Now, I don't want to be put on the charge for what I'm saying next. That of all the Labour leaders 